Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys again. I was with you earlier uh, this year, so I appreciate uh, the invitation to come back. Uh, my three kids are with me this morning. Unfortunately, my wife was not able to come the first time. She wasn't able to come uh, today. She was bummed about that. She works at uh, the Children's Hospital, and so she's just coming off a night shift, but we look forward to a chance for her to come and meet you as well. But thank you for allowing me to come and to share in this Christmas season with you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at the shepherds this morning as we talk about a time for proclamation. But before I get into the passage, I wanted to start uh, with a story. It's an old story. Uh, a preaching uh, professor by the name of Haddon Robinson. It was, it was his favorite story. He liked to come back to it time and time again. It's a story about a Midwestern uh, well-to-do couple that one year uh, the wife decided that she was going to go on a, on a tour of a few of the, the great cities of Europe, and, but she wanted to go alone. So she told her husband, I'm, I'm heading off. I'm going to go to London. I'm going to go to Paris. I'm going to go to Rome, and then I'm going to end up in Vienna. And this was in the day back when we didn't have cell phones. And so she said, when I get to each one of the stops, I will give you a call, and I'll check in. And so sure enough, on uh, the route from the Midwest to London, she got to London. As soon as she got to London, she found a phone. She picked it up. She called her husband, and she said, hey, honey, I'm just, I'm just checking in, let you know I arrived. Okay, how are you doing? And her husband said, well, I'm doing okay, but unfortunately, Lucy, our cat, died. Well, she was, you know, that cat meant everything to her, and she was just overwhelmed in the moment, overcome in the moment, and, and she kind of composed herself after a, a minute or so of just crying and breaking down, and she said, she said you know what, that was, that was completely awful of you. That was so insensitive of you. If you were going to give me that news, you should have done it a different way. Now I'm just, uh, I'm in a turmoil here. And he said, well, honey, what, how else would you want me to deliver that news? She said, well, what you should have done is when I called from London, you should have said something like, well, well honey, I'm doing okay, but, but I found that Lucy, our cat, she's, she's up on the roof. And then when I made my way to Paris later on, then you could say, honey, uh, I've checked on Lucy. Unfortunately, she fell off the roof and I'm tending to her needs. And then maybe when I arrived to London, you could have said, you know what? I'm really doing my best to help her out, but she's not doing so well. And then finally, when I ended up in Vienna, then you could have told me maybe at that point, honey, Lucy has died. So her husband's just trying to take all this in, trying to figure out, what his wife wants when she changes the subject. And she said, well, you know, I asked you to stop into my mom, how she's doing. And without missing a beat, he said, well, honey, I went over and your mom's on the roof. <laughs> Delivering bad news is hard, right? It's difficult. And we don't like to do it. And how, how exactly do you deliver bad news? I mean, there's not a good way to do that. So it stands to reason that we might think that delivering good news would be easy. But it doesn't quite work out that way, it seems. This week, as we're in this Christmas, Christmas series, we're talking today about proclamation, right? Proclamation is delivering news. And thankfully, here's the good part, we have good news as followers of Jesus Christ to deliver, right? Right? At the Avon campus, Pastor Rob is, is preaching this Christmas through John 3.16, a simple message that summarizes the good news of Jesus Christ, right? For, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, that is not just good news, it is great news. So you would think that would be easy to deliver. And yet the truth is that for many in the church today, the job of delivering this news is actually not only considered difficult, but for many folks, it's simply disregarded. In 2018, Barna uh, released uh, a report called Spiritual Conversations in the Digital Age. And as they do, they release research that they have done as they have surveyed uh, churchgoers, church attenders, uh, believers, 
And so they've been doing this for a long time. And, and specifically since 1993, what they have found is that fewer and fewer church people respond with a positive affirmation to this statement. Every Christian has the responsibility to share their faith. So since 1993, the positive response of yes to that has taken a nosedive. And it's eye-opening. And the question that I have is why? Why are we afraid of good news? Why are we shunning this responsibility of proclamation to all men? Well, as we look at our story this morning, I want that question to sort of hang in the air in, in the room and, and for you personally to, to really consider that question for yourself. So let's look at Luke chapter 2 and the shepherds. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is well pleased. So we find that the, the shepherds are out doing what shepherds do. They are tending their flock. And one of the the Interesting things about the Christmas story always has been to me that of all the, the characters and figures that are involved just be, before the birth and at the time of the birth and then even after the birth as we talk about wise men, of all the figures involved of that, that broader nativity scene, it is the shepherds that to me are the least obvious people that would be invited into this grand narrative in history. And yet here they are right in the middle of the most important night in history. And these shepherds are absolute nobodies. I mean, at least we can, can kind of look to the wise men as, as important figures, learned men from afar who travel and they go to great lengths to find uh, to the fulfillment of this prophecy and to find uh, out about Jesus Christ, this king that is to be born. And you think, okay, the wise men fit into that narrative. They're somewhat important. They have some, some learned knowledge. They, they have something to offer. What do the shepherds really have to offer when you think about who they were as people? Not much. So they're the least obvious. And yet it's their response that is one of the most amazing to me. It, it is clear and it is immediate. What was their response to what was told to them and what they witnessed in the birth of Jesus? Their response was proclamation. Without hesitancy. Right away. So let's look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered. They were amazed. They were astounded at what the shepherds had told them. After they see Jesus, these nobodies who are invited into this grand story, they're integral in the work of spreading the word. And they take seriously the job of proclamation. So here's a good question. Why was proclaiming Jesus the obvious next step in their minds? Because in the church today, as Barna notes and others have been noting, proclamation of the gospel is far from the obvious next step and far from, from many people's minds. Why did the shepherds move so urgently from, from hearing 
right? And experiencing the, the good news in message from the angel. And then from hearing then to going and seeing Jesus in the manger. Why did they move from hearing and seeing and then believing, obviously, and, and that, that ownership of faith in this, this delivered Son of God? And why did they move then from believing good news to proclaiming it? Boy, if we can wrap our minds around that, maybe the church today could figure something out, out about what we see in the New Testament and the rapid spread of the gospel in spite of a hostile culture. So let me give you just a few things this morning to sort of try to wrap our heads around that question. Why, why these men and why did they proclaim so readily, so easily, so excitedly the good news of the gospel? Well, first, I think it is clear that they had a genuine life-changing experience with God. So again, the scene is quite dramatic. They're out in the middle uh, the pastor, they're out doing what they do. It's always quiet. It's always boring. And yet here is the scene of angels interrupting and not only just the angels, but a host of heaven. And, and a, I, I can't even imagine how insane they thought that moment was that just invaded and interrupt, interrupt their lives. And so it was quite an experience. And then the angel says, there's been born for you, right? It's been born for you. So this experience is very personal to these, these shepherds, and it's overwhelming. And, and so then the, the, the host, right, the multitude of, of heavenly hosts are praising God, and, and so it's just an overwhelming scene. Here are lowly shepherds just doing their job, and heaven shows up. God invades the lives of these men. Here, they're able to hear the great news proclaimed. They're able to see, go and see the great news of Jesus Christ in the flesh. And because of that night, they are changed and they will never be the same. The Bible says that the same thing happens to us when we hear the truth and we believe and receive the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not the picture, a heavenly host and invading the middle of the night necessarily. That wasn't my experience. Maybe that was yours. But, but in just as dramatic of a way and a, and a dramatic of a change, the Bible says that when we receive the truth, the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God enters into our hearts and into our lives. He invades our moment and our lives and we are never then the same. We are changed. The Holy Spirit comes in. Our sins are forgiven. And in walking with Jesus Christ, we are to be changed. We're to experience change, life change for the rest of our lives as we walk with him. So we need to really consider something. What type of, of people urgently take on then the mission of proclaiming the good news? Well, it, it is people who have genuinely experienced and had a life-changing moment with God. Have you ever met someone that had a life-changing moment or story? Maybe it was their, related to their health or the, the, the healing or health of a loved one. I've, I've met people along the way in this country and others who've told me that God, God invaded their life and in a moment of darkness, he healed them emotionally, physically, that, that God really did a work of healing in their life and, and they can't ever st stop talking about it. Or maybe it was a relationship or, 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 or someone that, that God brought into their life that just changed the dynamic for them. And, and they never stopped giving God thanks for that person and talking about the moment that that person changed, that God brought that person into their life. So maybe, it was, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a, it was a career uh, illumination, God, a, a mission, a calling. This is how I put the gift of God and the spirit of God in my life into action in this world. And this is what God wants me to do, a sort of a missional type of thing. Maybe it's an adventure that God has called someone on. And th those kind of people who have had a life-changing experience with God, you know, the, the thing that unifies them all together as I met them along the way, they can't stop talking about it. They won't shut up. Why? Because it changed their life. It continues 
to change their lives. The shepherds moved from hearing good news, seeing good news, to urgently proclaiming good news because they had a life-changing experience. So let me ask you, have you truly had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ? Maybe when you hear about, <coughs> excuse me, this, this idea or this thought of, you know, reaching out into, into these neighborhoods and, and impacting our, our neighborhood and our culture and our, our towns and, and seeing God move in powerful ways. And you, you think about, yeah, I'd really like that. And then you hear further this idea that, by the way, as the church, as the people of God, we're called to go out there. We're called to share good news. We're, we're called to, to, to tell them about Jesus Christ. And it's at that point you say, okay, you had me until you said, I, I've got to do that because I don't think I can do that. Really? Have you really had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. And, and, and if that's happened in the past and you came to Christ maybe years ago, are you living in, in a relationship with Jesus Christ where you're allowing him to continue to change and transform your life? Because for those who really are living in that sort of way, I can tell you that, that if you'll just connect to the Lord in that way and say, I'm, I'm faithful, I'm available, he will give you the ability to never be able to shut up about it. And he'll give you the, the ability to share and to deliver that news with the leading of the Holy Spirit in a way that lifts up the people around you. So they, they had this life-changing experience, but there's a second thing here, and it is as they hear the words from the angel, Right? Good news for all the people. It is that they're compelled by the universal nature of this good news, of this message, right? It, so, so it's not just personal, it's universal. There's an implication in the angel's words. I'm sharing this with you, then you will share with others. And so they hear this amazing news out in the middle of nowhere, and just a few of them, and then all of a sudden, the light show and the, the dramatic scene, it just closes right up. And then they look around and it's just them again. And it says they put their heads together and they figure out a, a, an action plan here. They're going to go physically and confirm it. And then from there, what do they do? They tell everybody that they know. <coughs> Isn't that interesting? These shepherds picked up on the implication. And they didn't keep the gospel to themselves. They didn't buy into the idea that I've heard many times in ministry over the years. This idea that our faith is, is just our own. That it's, it's a private thing. It's, it's um, you know, it's... it's yeah, I'll share it if I get an opportunity, maybe if the heavens open up and the stars align and it's just a perfect opportunity. But, but really our faith is private and it, and it is our own. I hear a lot of that. I've heard a lot of that over the years, but the truth is it may be popular, but it's not at all biblical. In fact, it's a perversion of the truth and it's a lie directly from the enemy of God. I was reading an article entitled The Glorious Gospel where the author was, was sorting, writing out all of the reasons why he said uh, the gospel could be described as glorious. And what he meant by that was that the good news of Jesus Christ is praiseworthy that it is wor worthy of getting excited about. It's worthy of sharing. It's worthy of, of, of just uh, honoring God, not just on a Sunday and pray, singing his names, but every day. The good news of Jesus Christ is worthy of our worship. <coughs> One of the many reasons that he mentioned caught my attention. He said the gospel is glorious because it is both personal and universal. I think that's true. So yes, the, the gospel is personal. But in, in the same way also as it is personal, it is also immediately universal. 
And so if we take on the attitude or the, the, the belief, well, my faith is my own. It's not really something I'm comfortable sharing or that I feel that I even should share. By the way, a growing number of younger adults in the church, uh, again, through Barna's research, are telling us they, they not only think it's, they don't think it's their responsibility to share their faith, but not only that, they think it's a bad thing to share their faith. And that's not true. It is personal, yes. But this is good news, as the angel said, for all people. It is universal and meant to be shared. The shepherds couldn't even read. They couldn't read an article. The gospel is glorious because of all of these different reasons. They didn't need to read an article. Because in that moment and with the the news delivered, they were compelled by the universal nature of what they heard. They hear news. They see news. They go tell news. They're compelled as an extension of their practical worship of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Third, these shepherds were able to share because they didn't let their social standing get in the way. I mentioned that that of all the, the people included, the shepherds are the, really the most astounding and shocking because they don't really belong at the birth of a king, right? And, and I think that inclusion, even though it's shocking, I believe it's intentional. God intentionally includes these men and he compels them in the work of proclamation. Why? What's the implication of that? Well, these shepherds, are not just average working men. Actually, they were some of the lowest people in society. You've probably heard that before. Now, a, a lot of folks couldn't read and write. A lot of folks didn't have education. That, that wasn't uncommon. But, but these guys were kind of the lowest of the low. They were the slowest of the slow, if you, if you would. They, this kind of job was relegated for those kinds of people, Right? They also, of course, along with that, had no wealth or standing in the community. They were the poorest of the working poor. They had no gifts like the Magi had to offer a king. They had no status. They were reviled in a lot of ways. They, they could not take time out of their schedule for ritual cleaning. According to uh, Jewish custom, they were often thought to be, known to be shady and untrustworthy. Their reputation was so bad, they could not testify in court. Where have we heard that repeated in the Bible narrative? You remember? You remember the women? The women at uh, the resurrection? They were the first to to be able to, to know that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They were the first eyewitnesses. And they also... Women were not considered credible witnesses in the first century. Isn't that interesting? Both at the birth and the resurrection of Jesus, we find that those of the lowest social standing, lowest reputation to proclaim anything as news or as trustworthy, it's those kind of people invited directly into the critical work of proclaiming what God has done. What, what should that communicate to every one of us here today? Have you ever felt that you're not worthy to share the gospel? Have you ever felt that uh, maybe your life hasn't quite lived up to a testimony that would be worthy of telling your neighbors, hey, you know, this is why Jesus is so great? Have you ever felt a little uh, embarrassed or ashamed that maybe you don't know enough of the Bible? Oh, I, I couldn't answer everybody's questions or, or the questions that people have. I'll screw it up. I'll say the wrong thing. I'll deliver it in the, in the wrong attitude. God, I am the worst possible person to deliver this news. You could come up with hundreds or thousands of people better than me to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, here it is, right through the testimony of God's word. If you feel that or have ever felt that, you're in good company. You're in good company with the shepherds. You're in good company with the ladies who were at the resurrection of Jesus. Because in their culture, nobody thought their word was worth a thing. And yet God said, those are the very people. Those are the very first people. I'm going to give the news 
and give opportunity for them to share the news of Christ. Don't let your lack of standing, however you would describe that, get in the way of you proclaiming good news. Let's, let's end here with one final point. The shepherds also are able to and willing to communicate quickly, effectively, and, and, and spread that word far and wide because in this moment, at this evening, they were provided with three powerful words to be able to share this news. Beyond the basic story of excited people sharing, you won't believe, I'm out in the pasture, we're there, and then Frank, you saw it, right? The heavens opened up, an angel came down, then we saw the heavenly host. Meanwhile, everybody in the room was like, oh, they've been tipping a few back, something's going on, right? They're sharing the basic story. They're excited in the moment, the lights, the everything else going on. So they're sharing that aspect of the story just like we would today. But beyond that, beyond that that Christ has come and they were able to see, they they were able to hear from the angel and then go directly and see. Yes, we even saw the baby in the manger. Beyond that, the angel gives them a clarifying message. And I want to give it to you today because again, if you feel you're not worthy, you don't know what to say. Well, the good news is that the angel gave them three powerful words, three powerful ideas that anybody can take and communicate about your life and how how Jesus Christ has come into your life and changed you. So let me give those three words to you today. The first one is fear. Fear. Have you ever noticed in the Bible that when God shows up on the scene through through an angel, through an experience, one of the, the, the natural responses is what? fear. I mean, have you ever been wonder, sitting around thinking, God, I really, I really want to believe in you more. God, I really want to trust you. I really want to live this thing out. So God, if you could just show up, if you could just show yourself to me, don't pray that unless you're ready to, to literally die on the spot in fear because it is a frightening thing. So often you hear in response to an occasion like that, don't be afraid, fear not, Right? And that's exactly what we see here. And, and so th- this is a powerful word because the truth is that fear is a universal experience of all men. We all fear something. And fear is also a powerful motivator in order to think about the larger questions in life. So fear is a shared reality And do not be afraid is, you may not know this, it's the number one command in the Bible, the most repeated command. Do not be afraid. When when we share the truth of Jesus Christ and who he is, we need to share about some fears that we've struggled with. We need to share then how Jesus has, in in his presence and with his salvation, where he has filled the gap. He has entered that void that fear creates. And we're able then, not not saying that life is easy or life is always good, but in our fear, we are able to cry upon a God who says, do not be afraid. I am with you. Fear. The second word, the angel delivers this news and says, it is, this is a joy. So fear, joy. Joy is a deep desire for all men in this world, but the truth is that men settle, even in our own language in our, in our country, men settle for the pursuit of happiness. And I can tell you that the pursuit of happiness is a never-ending pursuit that never satisfies because happiness comes and goes. But joy, joy in Christ is something that stays with us, that stays with us when we're happy or when we're sad when things are good or when things are bad, there's a joy that stays with you in Jesus Christ. We need to communicate that to the people around us. I'm joyful this Christmas season, even though these things are happening. I'm joyful because of who Jesus is in my life. And then a third word is peace. The angels sing this peace, right? The hosts of heaven that the coming of Jesus means 
peace, another deep need for mankind, but only, the scripture says in Jesus, are we offered a peace that, per, per, that surpasses all understanding, right? A peace that isn't dependent upon circumstances. The world, the people in our community, apart from Christ, they're looking for a peace, but the only kind of peace that they want or that they know is a peace where all the circumstances are lining up the way that they want them. What we have in the gospel and in Jesus Christ is a peace even and especially when circumstances aren't the way that we want them. A peace in the storm. So you don't have to have the answers to everyone's questions to share the good news. You don't have to be a Bible expert. You don't have to have a special job or hold a leadership position in a church or a ministry. You don't have to go through uh, extensive training. You don't have to read 10 books on how to share your faith. Just communicate your living testimony of how Jesus has changed your life, continues to change your life in those three words, fear, joy, and peace. So why do we continue to hesitate to share good news? Go back to that first word, fear. I think fear often drives our silence, but the truth about fear is that we all experience it, but as we mature as disciples in Jesus Christ, we find that, that fear is driven away in the presence of genuine joy and peace. So if fear is something that resonates with you today as to why you don't often share your faith with the people around you, you're afraid you'll get it wrong, maybe you're afraid of losing a relationship, maybe you're afraid of how you'll be seen at work, maybe you're afraid, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of reasons to fear. If that resonates with you, could I just challenge you? Are you really experiencing a daily walk with Jesus Christ in his joy and in his peace on a regular basis, because those things drive away fear. Fear is a part of the process of sharing the gospel and making disciples. Helping others know who Jesus is, to come to faith, to walk with Christ, it involves fear. But then we point to his joy and his peace. Proclaiming the gospel, being involved in the mission of Jesus Christ, it's worth any fear that we experience along the way. And when we proclaim the gospel, we make his name great. And in that, there's no end to our fulfillment and our reward. Let me end with this, with this story. It's, it's the legend of Lassiter's Reef. It's Australia's own a story of gold and El Dorado and that sort of thing. It's, it's quite famous. Actually, if you grow up in Australia, every man, woman, and child has heard this story. They repeat this story. It has inspired thousands of treasure hunters. And so the man's name was Harold Lasseter. And in 1930, he was on a mission. He was out to rediscover what he said was a 14-mile reef of gold that he claimed that as a young man he had stumbled upon and, and knew that was there. He had found it, but he had not been able to find his way back to it. And so he set out in 1930. He went to the place he thought it was in this desolate corner of central Australia. It's about a four-hour helicopter ride from anything resembling civilization. It's an aboriginal territorial, one of, one of the most unforgiving environments in the world, but he was intent. He was on a mission, and, and, and experts say, historians say, he was obsessed. He was a man intent on making a name for himself, and he was going to find this reef of gold. So in July of 1930, he set out on an expedition that was beset by problems from the very beginning. The expedition party got quickly stuck in sand, they got lost several times. Food and water reserves ran out. The men on his, expedition, on his expedition were conniving. They were petty. And after all of this and over time, the men began to abandon Lassiter one by one. They, they were doubting his story of a gold reef. They were doubting him as a man. And so Lassiter finally angrily just set out on his own. 
He went out braving the brutal Australian heat, camping and writing letters in a journal that he always kept with him. Night after night, until one night his camels ran off, he was stranded without food and water, and he walked until he collapsed, dehydrated and starving. Some aboriginals discovered him. They helped him as much as they could. They got him to a cave out of the elements, and they took care of him, but they said there was nothing left that they could do, and they left him in that cave to die. So it's interesting. His skeleton was discovered many, many years later, along with this diary that he always had on his person. And in the diary, of course, detailed the entire tragic story, and it It's really sad to read. His last entry in the cave before he died really is tragic. Here's what he wrote. The agony of starvation may drive me to shoot myself. What good is a reef worth millions in gold? I would give it all away now for just a loaf of bread. It's a tragic story. A man who was so intent on making a name for himself that he was willing to die for something that historians and and scientists say never even existed. So let me close this morning by asking you, what is your Lassiter's Reef? What are you really chasing in this world? What are you trying to accomplish to make a name for yourself? What is your purpose here? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, could I just sum all of that up for you and for me today? Because our mission together in Jesus Christ, our calling is not to pursue a name for ourselves. It is to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And when your time comes, when your life is over, when you enter your cave and you write your last entry. My prayer is that you will be able to write when you die that you were not chasing your own dream and that you were not trying to make a name for yourself, but that you have exhausted everything proclaiming the name of Jesus to make his name great.